Many of you, thank you for being here tonight. It's such a delight to be able to worship uh, together. Uh, it's a privilege that I do not take lightly, and I'm thankful that you do not um, either. And so what a joy it is to be able to be together and to study, to sing, uh, to pray, to remember our Lord and all that He's done for us. To help us in doing that and better understanding Him, we've been studying in the Gospel of Mark. And by chance, if you're visiting tonight, if you want to go ahead and turn in your Bible to Mark chapter 8, that's where we're ready to study from. Just taking an exposition of this wonderful Gospel and seeing Jesus as the servant king. And that's a good way to describe Him. He is the king. He possesses all power. Uh, there is no authority that exceeds or surpasses His own. And yet He serves he shows His compassion and His love. He heals those who are sick. He does things uh, for others uh, that just uh, demonstrate the kind of heart uh, that He possesses. And that same heart and mind and love and compassion He still has for us tonight. And so thankful we should be that that is the case. Tonight, Mark chapter 8, verses 1 to 21, He's going to show again His great power to produce bread, but both the disciples and the religious leaders demonstrate what I might call a half-baked faith. And um, if you know what a half-baked faith is, um, maybe it's when some of my attempts at baking, which are few and far between, I assure you, uh, I just don't get the idea of baking very well, mainly because you have to be precise in your measurements. And Amy says, I don't like to be precise in my measurements. But, you know, sometimes you get the bottom done and the top's not, uh, you know, completely cooked through or vice versa, uh, as the case may be. Uh, it's not all the way through and through uh, cooked properly. And these guys, at least these two groups, as they encounter Jesus, uh, Jesus is going to point out to them that their faith is much like that in some ways. It's not fully developed yet. It's not cooked all the way through yet, uh, so to speak. In chapter 7, you might remember from last week, we looked at the compassion of Jesus for the Syrophoenician mother. She was a Gentile. She was not a Jew. And uh, Jesus yet shows compassion to her because of her faith. And then uh, in a very extraordinary, what I think a very extraordinary example of his love, he takes a man that was deaf and mute and he takes him aside from the crowd and he heals this man. And so again, the commendation, the uh, not just the commendation, but uh, the summation. Notice at the end of chapter 7, the Bible says in reference to Jesus, he has done all things well. Isn't that a wonderful statement? And no truer statement has ever been made. Jesus does all things well, and He still does tonight, even though we do not see Him working in the same way uh, that He worked then. He still works in such a wonderful way and can in our lives if we will allow Him. Take your Bible, though, to chapter 8 tonight. Let's begin reading in verse 1. We're going to read down to verse 21 and look at it in three separate sections. In those days, the multitude being very great and having nothing to eat, Jesus called His disciples to Him and said to them, I have compassion on the multitude because they have now continued with me three days and have nothing to eat. And if I send them away hungry to their own houses, they will faint on the way, for some of them have come from afar. Then his disciples answered him, How can one satisfy these people with bread here in the wilderness? He asked them, How many loaves do you have? And they said, Seven. So he commanded the multitude to sit down on the ground, and he took the seven loaves and gave thanks, broke them, and gave them to his disciples to set before them. And they set them before the multitude. They also had a few small fish, and having blessed them, he said to set them also before them. So they ate and were filled, and they took up seven large baskets of leftover fragments. Now those who had eaten were about 4,000, and he sent them away. Immediately got into the boat with his disciples and came to the region of Dalmanutha. Then the Pharisees came out and began to dispute with him, seeking from him a sign from heaven, testing him. But he, Jesus, sighed deeply in his spirit and said, why does this generation seek a sign? Assuredly, I say to you, no sign shall be given to this generation. And he left them and getting into the boat again, departed to the other side. Now the disciples had forgotten to take bread and they did not have more than one loaf with them in the boat. Then he charged them saying, take heed, beware of the leaven and the of the Pharisees and the leaven of Herod. And they reasoned among themselves saying, it is because we have no bread, but Jesus being aware of it, said to them, Why do you reason because you have no bread? Do you not yet perceive nor understand? Is your heart still hardened? Having eyes, do you not see? And having ears, do you not hear? And do you not remember? When I broke the five loaves for the five thousand, how many baskets full of fragments did you take up? 
They said to him, Twelve. Also, when I broke the seven for the four thousand, how many large baskets full of fragments did you take up? They said, Seven. So he said to them, How is it that you do not understand? I think that will be the crucial question for our study tonight. Not just for these men, but of course bringing it down to our day and to our own lives. Why is it, how is it sometimes that we do not understand? Jesus was frustrated with lack of understanding. And you know, in one way, that gives me a, just a slight bit of encouragement. Uh, because I encounter people, and you encounter people, not just speaking about others. Too often, maybe looking at the guy that looks back at me in the mirror, if I'm completely honest with him and completely honest with God, which I always should be, I wonder why sometimes maybe he does not understand like he should. And maybe you share that same frustration with yourself that the Lord shares with you also. Sometimes we just don't understand. Well, why? In verses 1 to 10, we have Jesus, again, with limited resources, compassionately feeding a multitude after the situation appears hopeless. Now, critics will say, if you turn your Bible back a few pages to chapter 6, beginning in verse 33, this is the same account just copied twice. But there are enough differences in details to show that there... Uh, is clearly two separate incidents in mind. We didn't look at this section in Mark because at the same time, uh, back last month, you remember we were going through John chapter 6 where Jesus feeds the 5,000, the only miracle recorded in all four Gospels. But Mark records it also in Mark 6, 33 through verse 44. 5,000 men plus women and children. Now the question might be for us in chapter 8, why is there a multitude here following Jesus? And I pointed out to you last week that if you go back to chapter 5 in Mark's gospel, Jesus heals a man that had an unclean spirit who had been in the cemetery crying out. No one could restrain him. He's a wild man. But Jesus, by his power, heals him, casting out that many number of unclean spirits or demons called legion. They go into the pigs and the pigs take a dive off the cliff and drown into the sea. That man, after having been healed by Jesus, said, I want to go with you, Lord. But Jesus told him, go home, this is Mark 5, 19, go home to your friends and tell them what great things the Lord has done for you, how he has compassion on you. And so what did that man do? He departed and began to proclaim in Decapolis all that Jesus had done for him and all marveled. This is where Jesus is now in chapter 8 in this region of the Decapolis. And maybe it was because of the preaching of that man about Jesus and the difference he had made in his life that now there is a great crowd gathered together to listen to Jesus. And Jesus notices that this is the case. And notice verse number 2, just a simple statement that gets to the heart, to the mind of our Savior. I have compassion on the multitude. That word compassion, as you know, is multifaceted. Uh, it's a word that's almost... You know, there's just not a sufficient one-word definition for it. It encompasses so many different things that include love and kindness, uh, that include, you know, a desire to care and to assist and to render aid. All of that and more. Jesus had compassion on the multitude. Three days they had been with Him. If they had brought food to enjoy the journey and the time with Jesus, no doubt they had not brought enough to extend it past this three-day period. And Jesus said, if I send them home... No doubt some of them are going to faint on the way. They just won't have the energy to make it back home. They've come from afar. How far? We don't know. Think about, um, you know, starting on a journey. Uh, it's hot in that area of the world. If you started off uh, later on, even tomorrow, but later on this week in the hot, intense heat, and a walk from here to Cookville or to Monterey or maybe even just a shorter distance than that to your home tonight, you might, like me, faint on the way uh, if you had not had sufficient food. So how can we, what are we going to do? That's really what Jesus uh, is proposing to these men without asking them specifically. Now notice verse 4. How can one satisfy these people with bread here in the wilderness? Jesus points out the problem, but what's the solution? Now I wonder, and others have too, if you go back to Mark 6, 37, when Jesus feeds the 5,000, Jesus there specifically told the disciples or the apostles, you give them something to eat. They had said to the Lord in the previous verse, send them away, it's a deserted place. Let them go into the villages and buy bread. They have nothing to eat. Jesus said, you give them something to eat. And they in response on that occasion said, shall we go and buy 200 denarii worth of bread and give them something to eat? What do you mean, shall we go and do it? Here in chapter 8, verse 4, there might be a slight difference 
where Jesus, not asking the question, but where these men perhaps, echoing in their mind or remembering in their mind the previous incident, said, it still seems hopeless, Lord. How can one here in the wilderness satisfy uh, these people with bread? There wasn't even an available village to go into. It seems they were in such a remote location. Well, Jesus said, how many loaves do you have? This time they have seven. Who those loaves of bread belong to were not told. Otherwise, in the previous account, you remember the little boy's lunch, five loaves and two fish. But they had seven. So they're sitting down. Jesus broke after uh, broke them, that is, uh, dividing them after giving thanks, giving these to the disciples and then they to the multitude. They also had a few small fish. That number is not specified. It could be two, three. How many ever? Again, if there are 4,000 people, clearly this is an occasion where there are limited resources. But Jesus again gives thanks, again multiplies them. In whatever way he did that, however that happened in your mind, you'll have to use your imagination like I use mine. But here's what I love on both accounts, what it says. So verse 8, they ate and were filled. It wasn't just a little snippet. Here's a little hors d'oeuvre or an appetizer. Maybe this will just whet your appetite and uh, get you a little further down the journey, closer going back home. No, these people ate till they were filled. And just like we said when we went through the feeding of the 5,000, there's probably never been a better fish sandwich, if we want to call it that. Never been a better occasion where fish and bread were joined together uh, than on this occasion. And I'm sure these people, for as long as they live, some of them maybe, uh, like that little boy in the feeding of the 5,000, maybe there were some children there that just had a conscious memory of that, maybe being four or five years old. And don't you know if they lived till they were 100 years old, they might gather you know, their family and children and grandchildren around and say, let me tell you about the time I ate what Jesus made for me. That was the best fish, the best bread I ever had. I just have to believe that's kind of how it must have happened. Well... All were filled to satisfaction. Those were who had eaten were about 4,000. Seven large, notice verse 8, large baskets. This is not the word for like a lunch pail. This is the large basket, the same word used in Acts 9.25 that the apostle Paul could fit in when they put him over the wall in Damascus that we studied about in vacation Bible school. Uh, like a hamper almost, if you will. A large suitcase almost, we would say in today's lang uh, language. Seven large baskets of leftover fragments were taken up. Jesus then, with them sufficiently filled, able to make the journey on their own back home, sends them away. They enter the boat, Jesus and the disciples. They go to Dalmanutha. This is the only mention of this place in Mark's gospel. We don't know exactly where it is. Uh, Matthew's parallel account says it's in the region of Magadan, which may be on the western side of the Sea of Galilee, if you're looking at your uh, map in the back of your Bible. Well, what do we learn from this? Uh, again, King Jesus feeds 4,000. King Jesus has limited resources from a human perspective, but with His power, look at what great things can be done. Tonight, the application, of course, is clear. We often like to talk about our limited resources, but if we entrust them to the Lord, if we allow Him to use them and bless them as He sees best, then what great things might He do with us and through us to the glory of God? Well, only, uh, only He knows and only will be seen if we are willing to do that kind of trusting. Well, verses 11 to 13, the Pharisees come out and challenge Jesus. They're looking for a sign to discredit Him, but He's not going to turn His ministry into what I call a circus sideshow. Notice... Uh, coming out as they land presumably on the other side of the lake, the other side of the Sea of Galilee. They want to dispute. They want to fuss. They're like the playground bully. Did you have a playground bully in school? Hopefully you weren't the playground bully in school, but you know uh, uh, that guy that just always wants to cause trouble. Or maybe the one that's always boasting and says, I can do or my you know, family can do or whatever. And someone finally challenges him. The Pharisees are like that. Prove it, Jesus, who you say you are. Give us a sign from heaven. Maybe they were thinking about the Old Testament examples when manna came, when God fed the people in the wilderness. Maybe they were thinking about the day when the sun stood still as the children of Israel went into battle. Maybe they were thinking about, like in Genesis 19, when God got so fed up and destroyed the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah, raining fire from heaven. They said, Jesus, do something like that. That's what they're asking. Now, notice our Lord's response. Here's this half-baked faith. Do they have faith? Are they making a true faithful request of Jesus? Not at all. Verse 12, he sighed deeply. 
You remember back in chapter 7, verse 34, before healing the man that we studied about last week, the Bible says Jesus sighed. And I said on that occasion, that word means he moaned. He almost felt pain, as it were, and empathy for this man and his condition. This word, sighed, is a different word in the original language. It's a word of frustration. You've had those times when you sigh out of frustration. If you're a parent, now if you're not a parent yet, maybe you've not, but that comes along uh, with parenting. And I will say, and kids, I'll go ahead and just give you uh, your due as well. Sometimes I know kids, they sigh with mom and dad. Mom and dad, you never listen. You never let me do what everybody else does. There may be a good reason for that. So that parent-child relationship or spouse relationship or almost any human relationship, sometimes we sigh deeply. We're frustrated. But this sigh that Jesus had, I have to believe, is maybe more intense even than ours. He sighed deeply, notice what the Bible says, in his spirit. He knew what was in the hearts of these men. He knew what they were trying to do. They were not tricking him. Uh, it was not something that he's caught off guard by. He's frustrated. And really, at the same time, maybe along with his frustration, he is heartbroken that they would make such a baseless, silly request. Now, Jesus said, no sign will be given to this generation. Why do you seek for a sign? In other words, if you guys would open your eyes, you'd already been able to see and observe all the things I've done up to this point. You're wanting a sideshow, a circus sideshow, as I'm calling it. You're just wanting something, again, uh, to try to say, if I'm not going to do it, you're going to try to use it against me. So I'm not even going to entertain your thoughts whatsoever. Now, Mark 16, or excuse me, Matthew 16, when Matthew records this same event in verse 4, Jesus says, according to Matthew, that he said, only the sign of Jonah will be given to this generation. And he doesn't explain it further. That seems a little strange now, if you remember the story of Jonah the fish, three days in the belly of the fish, finally goes to Nineveh after trying to run away. Is Jesus alluding to his resurrection? Probably that's what we guess. But here Mark doesn't even take notice that uh, he's even going to make mention of that statement of Jesus. Instead, verse 13, Jesus leaves them. Getting into the boat again departs to the other side. It's almost like they pull their boat up to the dock or to the shore. These guys come out and they start fussing. Jesus said, I've had enough of you guys. Not even going to pay attention to you. I'm getting back in the boat and heading somewhere else. And so he does. He isn't going to be at their beck and call, their whim Jesus, that's not what he is. Now, the application for us may be in this, as we think about our faith, if we really trust him, uh, are we sometimes guilty of maybe making such demands of the Lord? Not to show a sign from heaven, but do we think that he responds at our whim? That he is just, uh, as it were, at our command? If we do, we're sadly mistaken. That's not who Jesus is at all. Verses 14 to 21 they start back across the sea. This time the destination uh, is not clear until we get to verse 22 and find that it's at Bethsaida. Uh, and so they may, again, if you're looking at your map of the Sea of Galilee, again, depending on where these regions are, uh, they've got a, a good boat ride of maybe a couple of hours. It's hard to know exactly depending on the wind conditions and other weather uh, conditions, just how long it would have taken. But uh, they have a private classroom with Jesus on board the boat with them. He tries to teach them. The Lord does, but sadly, he finds them to be, that is, his own chosen followers as obtuse. That word meaning, of course, just as unperceptive, as stubborn, as really just... Uh, you remember Charlie Brown, what they always called Charlie Brown? You blockhead. You remember now... I know, parents, you're putting your fingers in your kids' ears. Don't listen to Mr. Allen. Don't call somebody a blockhead. Don't do that tomorrow at school, kids. I'm not telling you to do that. But, uh, you know, that was the criticism of Charlie Brown. Maybe sometimes he deserved it. These guys, if uh, I was describing them, I think Jesus might have said, you guys, you're blockheads. Don't you know? Don't you listen? Well, what do we mean by that? They had forgotten to take bread, so Mark sets the scene for you. They did not have more than one loaf with them in the boat. Now think about this. Jesus in John 6 says, I'm what? The bread of life. They only have one loaf with them. What happened to those seven baskets that they took up in verses 1 to 10? Maybe Jesus sent them with different people groups as they went back home to help sustain them on the journey. I don't know. It doesn't seem like they made them on board the boat here. Or maybe they ate them on the other ride from uh, where they were at to this Dalmanutha region. I, I don't know. But there's only one loaf with them. Is that literal, an actual loaf of bread, or is it Jesus, the bread of life? Well, it doesn't tell us. That may just be one of those curious little details. 
But Jesus begins to teach. He takes this opportunity. They're, pri uh, they're in a private setting. They're out on the water. The crowds are not, uh, you know, in their vicinity. The Pharisees aren't within earshot. They're just enjoying, uh, you know, taking a casual uh, sail across the lake. Jesus begins to teach them. Actually, the word there for charge is a strong word to impress upon them some imperatives. So he says, take heed, beware. Pay attention, guys. I've got some important stuff to tell you. Here's what it is. Beware of the leaven. The word leaven, of course, refers to yeast. The rising agent in bread, most often. You ladies know that. Some of you guys understand it as well. All of us have maybe a mild appreciation for how that process works. Beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the leaven of Herod. What is Jesus talking about? Well, they begin, verse 16, to reason. And that's a word, another strong word that really means to argue. They're hitting each other with their elbows saying, I told you to bring bread. You see, he, knew, he knows we don't have any. They're fussing. It's because we have no bread. Now just try to, and in your mind again, like I've always told you my attempt when studying Scripture, I'm trying to put myself on board the boat with these guys. I'm trying to put myself, you know, right here in the situation. And I, what I've just observed, what I've just experienced, I've just watched Jesus with, you know, a very limited amount of bread feed an entire multitude of people. I've seen him do that before, feeding 5,000 with five small pieces of bread. I've seen his power in action. And now, whether it's Jesus himself or whether I'm looking and I just have one loaf of bread to share among, if we think just 13 in the boat, Jesus and the 12, uh, you know, what am I worried about? Or what should I be concerned about? It's because we have no bread, they said. Well, Jesus being aware of it. Again, Jesus is not tricked. He's not deceived. Why do you reason? Verse 17, do you think he said that with an elevated volume? I think he probably did. Why do you reason because you have no bread? Do you not perceive nor understand? Is your heart still hardened? Have you guys forgot everything you've just seen? Are you that hard-headed? Are you that stubborn? Are you that obtuse? Whatever word you prefer to use. What is he talking about? This leaven. Well, the leaven stood for evil influence. Exodus chapter 12, before the Passover was celebrated and commemorated for the first time, God said, get it out of your house. So subsequent years, the Jews would do that again. Exodus 23, verse 18, God said, when you offer your sacrifices, do not offer them with leaven, with yeast. Was God against uh, bread that was leavened? No, not just for general consumption, but when it was offered to him for specific purposes, it had to be unleavened. As we observe the Lord's Supper, we always talk about unleavened bread because Jesus used that in the Passover meal to make the connection and now the commemoration of his own body and the remembrance of it as our act of worship that we observe still today. So what Jesus is saying, take heed, beware of the leaven, the evil influence. And like leaven is insidious. A little bit can spread. That can be a good thing. In Matthew chapter 13, Jesus said it can be a good thing. The kingdom of heaven might start small, but it will expand greatly. But like Paul also uses it later to the church at Corinth, a little leaven leavens the whole lump. If you have a little evil in your life, the devil won't be content to let that little evil stay little. He'll continue to make it grow. It'll continue to be progressive. And so our task as the people of God is to try to eradicate sin in all measures from our life. Now, we'll never succeed perfectly at doing that. But while we'll never succeed perfectly at eradicating all sin from our lives, we must never get comfortable or willing to accept or tolerate even the smallest measure of it. We ought to live lives of repentance every day and ask God to look. And I can tell you, again, with no glory but with much shame, I can look back on my life. And I can think of some times where uh, there were some things there that shouldn't have been. And I accommodated that. I tolerated that. I justified that in my own foolish way of thinking. Say, nah, you know, that's not that bad. Well, at least it's not what, you know, so-and-so is doing. And, you know, there's always somebody that's so-and-so that's doing something so much worse than you are. But for the child of God, every Christian individually must examine himself or herself. Whenever I find sin, I need to get it out of my life. No matter if it's a small measure, large measure, anywhere in between. Jesus is saying, these guys, the Pharisees and Herod, they're evil influences. So get it out of your life. Don't listen to their teaching. Don't listen to their way of operating. 
don't you see? Your heart is still hardened. And he continues, verse 18, Having eyes do you not see? Don't you see what happened back there when I fed those 4,000? Having ears, don't you hear? Don't you remember? I think Jesus is frustrated, much like when he sighed deeply with the Pharisees. I think his frustration is maybe even mounting here. The guys that he had handpicked and selected to be his followers, they seem to be little, little different. Maybe not even any more perceptive than were those Pharisees. Just to make sure, verse 19, Jesus said, When I broke the five loaves for the 5,000, did you have enough? Yeah. Did you take up leftovers? Yeah, 12 baskets, lunch boxes full. I broke the seven for the 4,000. Did you have enough? Yeah. Did you have leftovers? Yes, enough that we could take up seven suitcases or hamper fulls. So Jesus said, how is it that you do not understand? How is it that you don't get that having a lack of bread or resources is somehow a problem for me? It's not. It's not. So what's the problem? What's the point that Jesus is trying uh, to teach to us? I think what he's asking all of us is this. What leaven, and I'm using that in quotation marks, I'm not talking about literal yeast. What leaven keeps us or keeps you, keeps me from understanding Jesus today? What evil, sinful influence? What voice or voices am I listening to instead of Jesus? What voice do I allow to have a greater priority in my life than the voice of God and the Word of God? Why do we sometimes have trouble comprehending and getting, if you will, what God wants us to know and do? I know you may say, well, preacher, that doesn't describe me. You should have told those people that were here this morning that aren't here tonight. They don't get it. I can understand that and I can appreciate that. But even for us, for all of us, there is room for improvement. Let me suggest to you three things as we close uh, that might keep us from understanding Jesus today. Three, if you will, types of leaven. Uh, the first one is simply the problem of forgetfulness, or you could call it the problem of neglect, the problem of indifference. When I was a much younger preacher and wanted to try to impress people maybe more than I should, I would sometimes announce that next week I'm going to preach on the most dangerous sin in the Bible. And that would get a few people excited. But the most dangerous sin in the Bible may be the one of omission, the one of neglect, the one of forgetfulness. Notice uh, Jesus asked them, verse 18, Do you not remember? They had forgotten to take bread with them. Now, they might have thought like we often do, that's somebody else's job. And too often in the church, that's exactly what we sometimes do. You know, well, I know that needs to be done, but that's somebody else's job instead of just doing it ourselves. Or maybe... They didn't even see the need. Sometimes we're not observant enough to even see the need. We're not prudent and watchful, and we didn't prepare, and we are not ready when the need arises. That's apparently what these guys must have done. Now, Jesus does not. What, what's surprising to me, even though they had forgot, even though they were neglectful, even though they were indifferent, and they hadn't made preparation, notice what the Bible doesn't tell us on this occasion. Jesus did not multiply that bread. He might have said, you boys, you got a hungry belly? Let that remind you maybe the next time. He doesn't multiply this one loaf of bread that they have with them. I don't know if that's purposeful or not, just an interesting detail to consider. So the leaven, the evil influences that may keep us from understanding Jesus is simply forgetfulness. And with so much vying for our attention. And in our world today, there is so much. And I've just, in the last few months, I'm becoming more and more aware of this. And I'll tell you again, I'm not making any sort of braggadocious statement with this or arrogance, but uh, I've taken inventory of my life. And I've looked at a lot of things that I gave a lot of attention to that really aren't worth giving a lot of attention to. And you can put things like social media at that, maybe at the top of the list in today's world, and technology. Uh, I'm trying, I can't take it out of my life completely. People contact me, ask questions, do a lot of other things, but I'm trying to cut down considerably on that. Uh, I've cut down, and just to tell you another way that might be helpful to you, uh, cut down even my content, uh, my consumption of news. Uh, I want to be informed uh, somewhat about what's going on in the world. I don't want to stick my head in the sand, but I don't have to know every little detail about every little thing that goes on because usually it's all negative. That's not healthy for me, probably not healthy for you, spiritually, physically, or otherwise. 
Uh, what other things are you listening to maybe more than you should? A hobby or uh, something else that won't matter in eternity. Give consideration to that. Number two, another example of leaven is the problem of false teaching and evil influence. Notice Jesus started this out by telling them, Take heed and beware. Beware. Watch out for who, Jesus? The leaven of the Pharisees and the Herodians. Matthew 16, uh, Matthew tells us that Jesus adds on that occasion, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, and the Herodians. And I thought about, are there groups today that might parallel these? Now, we don't have Pharisees today, Sadducees or Herodians. But think about this. The Pharisees in the ancient world were the religious traditionalists. They were the people who said, you know, it has to be this way because it's always been this way. And we talked about that when we talked about how Jesus looked at people washing their hands. Tradition. They just elevate what they think ought to be done to serve God above what the truth of God's Word actually says. That's what the Pharisees did. So Jesus said, beware, that can be an evil influence. That can separate you from God if you allow your tradition to be elevated to or even surpass the value of truth in your life. So be watchful for that. What about the Sadducees? Well, in the first century world, they were the rationalists. They were the people who said there is no miracle, there are no angels, there are no... Um, there's no resurrection from the dead. They believed in Greek philosophy and tried to combine it with Judaism, the Jewish religion. So they were the rationalists. They said they were the intelligent people of the day. Think about today when we hear the scientists and again technology and education. We're often told these are the keys to solving the world's problems. And I'm not against education. You can go downstairs and look on my office wall. I believe in education. But as we think about education and technology and science and all of those things, those things are only a supplement to help us better understand the world that God has created and that He is the true answer to and that His Son Jesus is the only remedy for. All of those things have to be kept in mind. So beware of those evil influences in those realms. And then the Herodians, who do you think they represented? Well, they were the people that said, you know, we're going to restore the dynasty of Herod. Well, who was Herod? Well, go back in the intertestamental period after uh, they overthrew the uh, Syrians. And uh, they were the ones who, for the briefest of time, had a little bit of Jewish uh, independence. And so they said, we're going to go back and be an independent Jewish state. In other words, beware of politicians. That's in essence what he's telling them. Beware of the leaven of Herod. Beware of those who take the earthly kingdoms of men and concerns and elevate them above the spiritual concerns of the kingdom of God. I know it's already started. Have you watched? And like I said, I'm cutting down my consumption. Here's one good reason why. Election season has already started. And whatever side of the aisle you fall on, whatever color you like, uh, you know, I'm not even going to entertain that. It's too just bothersome to me to listen to all the fighting and the fussing. Now, you say, well, uh, shouldn't there be, you know, uh, the Christian re responsibility to try to exert influence as we have the privilege in this country to vote? I'm not saying that. I'm just saying don't get caught up in all of that because as we prayed earlier, and I appreciate it so much, coming straight from Daniel chapter 4, God rules in the kingdoms of men. He's going to take care of us. I don't know how the next election is going to turn out, uh, what leadership's going to change, what's going to be different or better or worse. I don't know any of that. Jesus said, beware of the Herodians. So when we think about government and politics and social services or our economy or our military strength or some program, and we say all of those are the key to a better life, it's a deception. It's a lie. Only Jesus is the key to a better life. Only His Word uh, can provide us the information we need to know how to live in this life, no matter what kind of government we live in or under. And I do pray that our freedoms will continue to preach and teach His Word, but even if it doesn't, we'll still preach and teach it regardless of the consequences. Jesus did not want us to be deceived or influenced by any of these. And then lastly, the leaven that keeps so many from understanding Jesus today, I think, is just the leaven, the problem of faithlessness. Not faithfulness, but the problem of faithlessness. Notice, Jesus says, you guys have had ample evidence, but you don't perceive or understand. Why? Verse 17, your heart is still hard. Your eyes, do they work? Your ears, do they work? Don't you remember these things? How is it, verse 21, this is where we said we would end, even where we started. How is it that you do not understand? This was their biggest problem. They said they believed in Jesus. 
but they did not live, act, or think like it. And we are often guilty of the same. Give serious consideration to that. Anybody that asks you, I know what you would affirm. 100%. Do you believe in God? Oh, yes. Do you believe in Jesus? Absolutely. Is the Bible the Word of God? Without question. That would be our reply. But is it reflected in the way that I live, the way that I act, the way that I think, as we echo back to this morning's lesson? If it's not, then those are just empty words. They're empty words and they're of no meaning whatsoever. Jesus rebukes their fretfulness for only having one loaf of bread. He said, the meager resources, those don't matter at all. I can take those and use them any way I want to because I am who I am. I am the I am is really maybe what Jesus would tell us. And so tonight, the servant king, are you one that he would ask as he examined your life, how is it that you do not understand? I pray that's not the case. I pray you're living, thinking, and acting in a way that shows your faith in Jesus uh, is true. That you're not led away or astray by these evil influences. But tonight the opportunity is given to you to consider your life. If you're not a Christian, understand what Jesus has done for you. What He wants more than anything else is to solve your sin problem. That's what He desires more than anything else. And He died to prove it. Think about that. How do we know Jesus is serious about saving us? He died to prove it. That's pretty serious if you ask me. Will you obey Him and allow Him to solve that sin problem with His blood tonight by repenting of your sins, confessing faith in His name, and being baptized to have your sins washed away? We'd assist you in doing that. As a child of God tonight, maybe Jesus would look at your life and say, You don't understand. Because you say you believe me, but you don't act like it. You say you believe in me, but you don't think like it. You say you believe in me, but you're not demonstrating that. And so remove the sin that's from your life. Don't even tolerate a little bit in there as a Christian. Do that by repenting and praying, even as we saw two of our sisters do this morning. We're glad to assist you as the Lord is in any way that we can. Please allow us that opportunity and come even now as we stand and sing together.